I want to talk to you today about spiritual sight. You may be here today and you don't know Jesus. You may be here today and you've known Jesus for a long time. One and all, we all need spiritual sight. We need an upgrade of our spiritual sight. Jesus is the light of the world because the world is in darkness. And every one of us need an upgrade in the way we see. We thank God for what he's done this year. But let me tell you something, that what we're walking into next year requires a greater degree of spiritual sight. You may be able to see with your physical eyes, but let me tell you the key to success in life, the key to abundance in life, victory in life, is the ability to see spiritually. If you don't see spiritually, you can be running the wrong race, you can be going towards the wrong goal, you can be looking to the wrong answers and miss the whole purpose for life. You can miss your calling, your destiny, your purpose because you are unable to see what God had for your life. Let me tell you today that every single person, and there is no exception, is called by God, is anointed by God, it has a gift from God, has a destiny and purpose. When God created you, even before you were formed in your mother's womb, the Bible says, I know the plans that I have for you, plans to do you good, not plans of evil, plans that bring you to a good end. God has an amazing plan for everyone. And yet we see right around the world in your life, you see, in my life, I see people that totally miss God's plan. They end up in the ditch of life, because they're blinded to what God wants. But Jesus has come as the light of the world so you would see. Amen. There's a lot of people that go to church that are blind. They think they've got God in a little neat box, but God's saying, you haven't seen anything yet. I want to open your eyes to what can be. You've downsized me, you've put me in a box, and I want to break out. I want to open your eyes to see. Amen. Who were blind but the religious Pharisees and the scribes? They thought they had God all neatly compartmentalized, but they were the blind, leaving the blind. And so I pray this prayer every day. Lord, anoint my eyes. Give me the spirit of wisdom and understanding. Open my eyes to see. I don't want to get to heaven. So I do want to get to heaven, but I don't want to get to heaven and have God say to me, you know what, Andrew? There were all these things I had for you, but you had, didn't have eyes to see. You were blinded to my purpose for your life. I don't want to live in deception. No, I want to see what God sees when he sees me. Yeah, don't you? Yeah. It has to be the cry of our heart, the ache of our heart. We have to go against the tide to break free from blindness and gather spiritual sight. So with that in mind, I want to talk to you about probably my favorite story in the Bible, Blind Bartimaeus. So are you ready? I've preached on this story more times than I've had hot meals. <laughs> so here we go. And then they, this is Jesus and his disciples, came to Jericho. Jericho is situated, it's a city that is at the lowest point of the earth, the city that's founded at the lowest place. It's a picture of the curse, it's a picture of despair. It's a picture of people that are at the very lowest point of life. You may know people like that. They're at the lowest point of their life. You may have been at the lowest point of your life this year. Jesus loves to come to people at the lowest point of their life. Has anyone ever had a low point in life? Just a couple of you. The rest are mountaintop dwellers. Thank God for you. You're our heroes. Everyone needs a hero, but I've had some low points this year, some challenges, and the great thing to know is in the midst of my pain, I can always find Jesus. They came to, Je to Jericho, and Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were then leaving the city. So it's one thing to be in a low point, but God doesn't want us to live in the low point. We may go through low points, but guess what? The good news is Jesus takes us out of Jericho. Jericho is no place to live. And as they were leaving the city, on the outskirts of the city, they found a blind man called Bart or Bartimaeus, as others may know him, which means son of Timaeus. They found a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus. And Bartimaeus was sitting by the roadside begging. 
Yikes. He's a great picture of many people. Maybe he's a picture of you today, blind to the life that we can have and blind to the person that God's called us to be. What a tragedy to be blinded to the life that God has called us to be, to have, and blind to the person God has called us to be. I don't know about you, but I know there are areas in my life that I'm blind because I know there's more to life than what I have right now. And I know there's more to what God has called me to be than what I have and what I perceive. So I pray, God, open my eyes to see more degrees of spiritual sight. Whether you don't know Jesus or whether you've been a long time in the faith, you need your eyes opened to see. And I'm here to open your eyes. Hmm. Blind Bartimaeus which means the son of Timaeus. Some of you may not know this, but Bartimaeus is an unusual name because it has two meanings. I often ask people when I find out their name, do you know what it means? I'm bemused by parents that call their children names and they have really bad meanings. It's like, why would you do that? You know, it's, it's difficult enough in life without slapping that name on them. You know, there's all sorts of weird names that have weird meanings. It's like, why would you do that? Bartimaeus has an unusual meaning because in the Aramaic, it means son of the unclean one or son of defilement. That's not a good start to life. Son of the unclean one, or in other words, his father was unclean. Bar means son, Timaeus means unclean. Son of the unclean one. No wonder he was blinded and on the roadside begging. That's not a great start to life. That's being born in Cheapside. That's, that's, that's going against all that's good for you. But the other thing about Bartimaeus' name, in the Greek it means son of honor. That's better, isn't it? Yeah. See, he's trapped between two worlds. The world that his father has pronounced over him and the world that God has pronounced over him. And many of us today, we've been pronounced, we've been... Uh, people have spoken over us all sorts of things that have blinded us to God's purpose for our life. They told us we'd never amount to anything. They told us that God doesn't exist. They've told us all sorts of crazy things and they've defiled what God has placed in our heart. But guess what? No matter what man says, God in heaven has the last say and it's his opinion that matters the most. People may not see the greatness in me, but it doesn't matter because my father in heaven says, I am a son of honor. And Jesus is coming to you today to remind you, no matter what people have said about you, his plan shall prevail if you will listen to his voice. Son of the unclean one or son of honor. See, the calling of the church, us today, is to pronounce what God sees over people. See, the church has got a bad rap and sometimes it's, it's caused it. But because the church hasn't always seen what it's called to do. We're not there to call out what is wrong in people. We're there to call out what God sees in people. The world already knows that their life's a mess. We don't, they don't need us to heap on a lot, whole lot of junk on them and say you're a sinner and you're going to hell. That's not helpful. What they need to hear is what God says about them, what God sees in their lives. He sees the greatness in them. He sees possibility in them. He loves them with an everlasting love. And to the day they die, even if they reject him, he will say, I've got a plan for you and I'm not giving up on you. That's the heart of the Father. Do you know the word church is ecclesia? And, and it essentially means it's, it's made up of two words, ek and ecclesia. And it simply means origin and surname. Ek is origin and ecclesia is surname. And so when we put that together, it's a community of people that call out people's original surname. Are you hearing this? We're calling out people's original surname. In other words, we're telling them who their true father is. Their true father isn't just a father on earth, but their true father is God in heaven. He is the one that created them even before we were formed in our mother's womb. He says, I know you. I knew you before even your mum and dad came together. You were in my mind. I created you. And so the church says, this is who you are. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Do you know, conversely, the word Hades is the word for hell. 
And it's an interesting name because Hades literally means to not see. Isn't that amazing? So while God, while God is opening our eyes to see who we truly are, the purpose of hell, the purpose of the evil one is to cause us to not see. So we walk around blinded to who we are. How can a man or a woman live 80 years on earth and never discover why they are here? There's got to be more than just going to work and coming home, checking in, checking out, buying a house, slaving all your life. Is that what it means to be alive? See, Hades causes us not to see. Oh, the devil wants to trap us in this darkened world, groping, looking for meaning and purpose. But even when we find Jesus, the devil still wants to hinder us, blind us. So we, we settle for less than what God wants. If the devil can't stop you coming to Jesus, the next thing he'll do, he will stop you. He'll use all his power to hinder you running the race that God has for your life. You will know the life giver, but you won't receive the fullness of the life giver. So verse 47. So when Bartimaeus heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus! Ooh. We're in church. <laughs> Son of David, have mercy on me. You'd shout too if you were blind. Many rebuked him. Shut up. Told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more. I love this about Bartimaeus. He's got spunk about him. He's got something inside him. They're saying, be quiet. Be quiet. Jesus is here. This is a religious holy moment. Don't you know that you're unsettling Jesus? Don't you know this is not decorum? Don't you know this is not how you behave around Jesus? He doesn't care. He's desperate. He shouts all the more, Jesus, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. I don't know what you've heard about Jesus. But as I read these scriptures, here's the truth. If you hear the truth about Jesus, it will reveal his compassion and it will cause you to cry out. See, some people don't cry out to Jesus because they haven't heard the truth about him. That they've heard that either he doesn't exist or if he does exist, he's angry at them or distant. That he's asking you to jump through all these hoops that he's impossible to please. Whatever it is that you've heard. I don't know what Bartimaeus heard, but he must have heard the truth because something welled up that he believed that if he cried out, he would touch a compassionate God who would stop and hear his cry. And what gives me faith to come to Jesus is I know his heart. And whenever I turn to him and I cry out to him, he always responds. Don't you love that about Jesus? You see, the sound of my cry is the catalyst to receiving. Did you hear that? The sound of your cry today is the catalyst for your receiving. For my cry positions me for Jesus' call. Amen. God never changes. His heart is always the same. But here's the truth. If you don't cry out today, God won't manifest himself. If you refuse to cry to Jesus, to call out to him, to reach to him, you will live all your life and never hear from him. He'll be standing there waiting, but he's waiting for you to cry out. Yeah. And this is your moment. I don't know why you're here today, but Jesus wants you to cry out to him. He wants you to lift up your voice. He wants you to, to say, God, I want more. I'm not satisfied. I need to see more of you. I need to experience you in a deeper way. Open my eyes to see. Yeah. I love this about Bartimaeus because... One thing I learned about him is that past setbacks need not determine today's outcome. He'd had a lot of setbacks. He'd had a lot of knockbacks. He had people saying, shut up, why don't you be quiet, you silly old smelly thing, get away. You know, he'd sat there begging. He'd been a beggar, you know, because no one would help him. He had to beg. He had a lot of setbacks. He's living in Jericho, for goodness sake. But it doesn't need to determine today's outcome. You may have had more hits than Elvis. You may have had a lot of knocks in life, but let me tell you today, it doesn't mean that God can't move today. That's right. Bartimaeus recognized that today was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. As I read this scripture, 
He knew that if he didn't do something today, he may miss out. Jesus was passing by. This was his day for a miracle. Do you get that? See, sometimes we stay blind because we've tried stuff before and it didn't work out. I've tried many things. I've, 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 I've been disappointed. I've reached out and I haven't quite made it. But I realize the key to life is to come back again and cry out to God, to call out again to him, not to give up because I realize that, yes, I've had some setbacks. Yes, I've had some disappointments. Some things haven't worked out how I felt they should have worked out. People have let me down. People have come. People have gone. All sorts of things have happened. But I need to know that I cannot afford to bring my pain of yesterday into my future. As I go into next year, I'm making a decision. I am leaving all the junk behind, the pain, the disappointment, the confusion. And I'm saying, Jesus, I'm coming with expectation that this year ahead is going to be the greatest year I've ever had in my life. And I cry out to you, Lord. Woo! Ha. Ha. See, you can say, this is my lot in life, or you can say, this is my day. This is just the way it goes. I've had more disappointment than you could, you know, it's just so many, you can say. Or you can say, this is my day. It's all about your attitude, and this is what I love about Bartimaeus. He's saying, this is my day for a miracle. Verse 47, it says, and when he heard it was Jesus. Do you get that? Do you hear that? Do you see what, what the writer is trying to say to us? He's blind, but he can hear. See, most of us would spend our days complaining about being blind. Oh, I'm blind, I'm blind, I'm blind. I can't see. Life's terrible. I'm blind, I'm blind, I'm blind, I'm blind, I'm blind. No hope, no future. Because we're focused on our one big problem. But it says... When he heard it was Jesus. We're so focused on our blindness that we ignore the fact that we can hear. And nature has this great... God, God implanted this in nature. And, and this is what he did. When one sense is taken away, all the other senses compensate to bring balance to your life. So when you take, lose your sight, your hearing goes to another level. That tells me that whenever there's mess in my life, God's going to compensate that mess by bringing strength to me in other areas. Are you getting this? So I might have had pain this year. I might have had disappointments. I might have had setbacks. But I know this about God, that he will strengthen me in other areas where there's pain so I'm able to compensate all the pain that's in my life and progress in life. So when I was younger, my father was taken from me at a young age. That could have been a weakness. That could have been my blindness for the rest of my life. I don't have a dad. I don't have a dad. I don't have a dad. <laughs> you know, that orphan suck on your thumb. Life is terrible. I could have ended up in prison. I could have ended up a hopeless case. Angry, bitter, resentful. But I know this about God, that whenever something is taken from us, God always comes back and gives us something that supersedes that, that brings balance and strength to our life. He, I lost my father, but I became a father. Yeah, and that's how it works. He lost his sight, but he got great hearing. And God always will balance things up in our life to get us to where we need to be so we can hear the voice of God and fulfill our destiny. The Bible says he is able to make all things work together for good, for those that love him, and that are called according to his purpose. Nothing that's been taken from you can stop you from achieving God's purpose for your life. There's so many examples of this in Scripture where things have been taken from people and God's compensated. Gideon, fearful, how could you use me? The least of the least. God compensates by giving him amazing spiritual sight. And God's doing that even in your life. Some of you are so focused on what you don't have and the problems you've got and all the things that have been taken from you that if you don't stop doing that, you can't go into the, your next year. God will always compensate. You'll bring people into your life, circumstances. God will do whatever it needs to be done to get you to your destiny. Bartimaeus could hear. 
And he began to shout out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. What, what you need to notice about this scripture, this statement is, they call in the Greek, it's in the imperfect tense. In other words, it's continuous. He kept saying over and over, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. No, he didn't stop. He kept saying it over and over and over and over until he got Jesus' attention. That tells me don't give up. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, the Bible says, and the violent take it by force. See, they say about church people that they're, you know, they're, they're people that wear cardigans and eat tomato sandwiches and, and, and they're boring and they drive Morris Miners and they do all sorts of weird things and they have pom-poms on their dashboard. They're, 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 they're people you know, that, that they're just the sort of people you don't want to be around because they've got no zest for life. They're, they're anemic. You know, I've got to be careful what I say. But you get, am I painting a picture of how the world sees believers? But the truth is... It takes a lot of courage and strength to follow Jesus. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. If you're going to follow Jesus, if you're going to go into next year with purpose and passion, there's got to be some, some resistance in your heart that says, I will progress. The Bible says you will seek me and find me if you seek me with all your heart. The key for next year is not to go into it passively, but to go in with it with all your strength. God, I will keep seeking you. I will keep pushing in until I get my breakthrough. If I need spiritual sight, I will keep going until you give me spiritual sight. I will not quit. How interested today are you in knowing God? I've met a lot of passive Christians. Oh, you know, I might come to church. Oh, what time is it again? Ten. Oh, it's a bit early. Oh, oh yeah, I guess, I guess I could make it. Oh, just hang on, hang on a second. No, no, I don't think I'll be there. <laughs> you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Oh, but I've got a bit of a cold. I feel a bit of a temperature coming on. <laughs> it's going around, you know. <sighs> just a little dose of God will be enough for some people. I, I want to be dosed up on God. Yeah. If the church is open, I want to be there. Yeah. I want to be with God's people. I want to be excited. I want to be passionate. I don't want to do life just meandering about. I want this church to be known as a people that love God with all their heart, all their soul and strength. And they may say that that church down on Lusha Road is a bit kooky, a bit over the top. I say, yes, that's us. That's us. We're not ashamed of that. Yeah, we're the freaks, the weirdos. Yes, that's us. Guilty, your honor. If that's what it means to love Jesus, yeah, I'm the freak, the weirdo, the one that's a little bit over the top. Because that's how Jesus feels about me. He was the freak, the weirdo that died on the cross. Can you say that about Jesus? Just did. You know what I mean, don't you? It's like, it's like, really? If Bartimaeus had to listen to public opinion in most Christians, he'd still be blind. That's the truth. Be quiet. He'll be excited. Go back to the back row. We have to deal with the religious spirit that stops us getting what God wants for our life, that wants to contain us. Here's the thing. Hungry babies cry for milk. That's the truth. And if there's not a hunger and a passion in your heart for God, then you need to cry out like Bartimaeus. Give me spiritual sight. It's not normal to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus, filled with the Holy Ghost, filled with Jesus, and to be passive about him. If, if that's what you are, you ain't got Jesus. You've got a dose of religion. But when Jesus comes into your heart, everything changes. And a passion comes to your life. I don't want anyone in this church that's not passionate. And if you're not passionate, well, stay here and get passionate. You're amongst good people that love Jesus. See, the crowd wasn't going to do anything for Jesus. And here's the truth. All those people around you, the naysayers, they're not going to help you get ahead. 
They're not the answer to your problem. Oh, don't get too serious about Jesus. Don't, don't pray too much. Don't read your Bible. Just, 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 just be normal. They're not going to help you get your breakthrough. And Bartimaeus knew enough to know that all these naysayers around him, the same be quiet, weren't his ticket to open eyes. His heart of passion was the ticket to success. And he knew that Jesus was the one man that could heal him. So verse 50, throwing his cloak aside in verse 50, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. He'd been stuck in a predictable life, a rut. This beggar's garment was like his, like his concession card. They gave garments in those days to people that identified them as the right to beg. It was your little concession card. You know, I don't want to earn too much money as I might lose my concession card. You know, it's got benefits. I get free health care, get free dental work. It's amazing. If you have it long enough, you get a free toupee. It's just, uh, I'm not going to lose my concession card. Jesus or your cloak? What is it you want? He had to throw it aside to come to Jesus. He had to believe that when Jesus touched his life, he'd never need that garment again. I ain't going back. Yeah. You can't put new wine in an old wineskin. You can't have the life that Jesus wants for you and keep thinking the way that you are. You've got to let it go. And there are people here today that God has such an amazing year ahead for you. I believe that. I'm not just saying that to make you feel good. I feel it in my heart that we, all of us, Every person that follows Jesus, that presses in it, he has the most amazing year ahead for you. He's going to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you could ask or imagine, Bev. So that means I'm going to have to throw my old beggar's garment aside, my old mindsets, my limited thinking. You see, Israel limited God because of their thinking. God is as large as I allow him to be or as small as I limit him to be. It's the way I think. I'm going to surrender that to you. If I'm going to have eyes that see, I've got to leave some things behind. If you change your thinking today, God will change your life. So verse 51, Jesus says to Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? Well, it's blinking obvious. I can't see. And you call yourself the Messiah. You don't even need a word of knowledge for that. Look. No eyes. Beggar's garment back there. Stick. Guide dog. Blind. Jesus says, what do you want? If Jesus came to you with one request, what would you ask for? When I was a kid... I used to say my one request would be that all my requests that I request come true. <laughs> That's pretty clever, isn't it? I'm not going to ask for an unending supply of Mars bars. I'm going to ask that every request that I request comes true. And the blind man, Bartimaeus, said these words, Rabbi, I want to see. Jesus said, your faith has healed you. And immediately, Bartimaeus received his sight. What an amazing thing. Your faith has healed you. Bang! His eyes come out, and he followed Jesus along the road. The one thing that you need from Jesus is this. Spiritual sight. That's the key for this next year. Jesus is saying, what do you want? You're hungry. You want more of me? What is it you want from me? Okay, you're knocking on my door. I'm answering today. What is it you want from me? If Jesus was standing right here beside me, what would you ask? More money? A new car? See, there are moments when Jesus comes to you and asks you questions like that. What do you want? What is it you want this year? When you get before him and you're waiting on God and you sense God coming close, what is it you want? And Bartimaeus says, I want to see. And here's the key for you this next year. 
starting from today, spiritual sight is the answer. I want to see. I want to see. Just a little segue. Abraham in Genesis 15, he was stuck in a rut too. Waiting for a baby that never came. And the word of the Lord comes to Abraham in a vision. Don't be afraid, Abraham. I'm your great reward. And Abraham says, that's great. Thanks, Lord. But what can you give me? Because what's the purpose of life without a child? You can give me everything you want, but it's going to finish with me unless I have a child. So God brings Abraham out of his tent to look up at the sky and see the stars. Look to the heavens and count, Abraham. So shall your children be. Abraham had spent years and years and years in a tent looking at an empty cot. They'd been the baby buntings. They'd bought cots. They'd bought prams. They had a 10-year supplies of nappies. They had baby formula, pacifiers. They had everything ready, but no baby. Years of disappointment. And he painted an image in his heart that God couldn't work with. As we come into this next year, what we need is fresh spiritual sight. So we're not looking at all things that can't be, happen, the things that have gone wrong. We offer up to God our eyes and say, God, give me fresh spiritual sight. For God can only work with those pictures that he creates. And if you've been like Abraham, like Bartimaeus, stuck in a rut, and you've created a vision for your life, the question is, can God work with that vision? So God uses the stars. Yeah. If I don't engage with spiritual vision, I'm always going to be stuck in time and space. If I don't engage with God's spiritual vision for my life, I'm always going to be stuck in time, limited to today, yeah. and space, confined to my natural circumstances. Yeah, right. And here's the thing about God. God's time is always now. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the same yesterday, today and forever. In other words, if you think of all of creation from the beginning to the end and suck it all up into one moment, that's where God is. He exists right now and even then and now. And the next thing I say, it's all one to him. He's in my yesterday, he's in my today and tomorrow all at the same time. Yeah. And he knows my future. And he lives in my future and in my present and in my past. And he wants me to get into the future he's created for me. So he gives me a picture to look at so I can align myself and align my faith with his reality. That's why Bartimaeus had to let go of the beggar's garment. That's why Abraham had to look at the stars because God will always give us a picture that pulls us into his reality. And as we go into next year... What you need is to let go of all your pictures of the past and your con concept of your life and grab a hold of his picture. Because when I grab a hold of his picture, it pulls me up into his reality. Abraham count the stars. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What was he doing? God was giving him a picture of his... Because you know why? Because as far as God was concerned, Abraham already had a son. He's talking to Abraham, look at the stars, but God's living in the moment when Abraham has a son. It's a reality to, to him. But over here, as he's talking to Abraham, it's not a reality. So God says, I want you to live in my world and I'll give you a picture that invites you into my world. Because unless you take a hold of my picture, you can't have the future that I have for you. Is that making sense? So spiritual blindness stops us from going into the future that God intended. I don't know how it works, but God has a plan for us. But unless we have eyes to see, we don't enter that plan. So we can get to the end of our life. And God somehow had a plan up here that had an amazing destiny. But we've walked down here and missed everything that was a reality in God for our life. Does that make sense? That God could have all these amazing plans and it's his reality, but I'm walking down here in my reality. And I'm saying, God, open my eyes. Give me the picture. So for Abraham, it's the stars in the sky. 
caused me to be lifted up into your reality. <sighs> Yongi Cho, one of my heroes. A woman came to him with throat cancer. Inoperable, she's going to die. Affected her voice, she can't speak properly. She needs a miracle, she's going to die in a number of months. So Yongi Cho says to her, I have a plan from God. I want you to go up to Prayer Mountain. Prayer Mountain is where the Koreans, would, thousands go each day to pray. There are rooms dug into a mountain and they pray and ask God for a miracle. He sends you up to Prayer Mountain. He says, here's your assignment. I want you to write out 10,000 times. By his stripes, you are healed. And each time you write it out, I want you to visualize in your mind that you are healed and whole. She goes up to Prayer Mountain. She writes out, by his stripes, I am healed. Visualizes it. I see myself right now free from throat cancer, totally whole, made whole, completely whole. By his stripes, I am healed. 10,000 times she did that. She comes back to see Yongi Cho. She's so excited because she's got a revelation now that God has healed her. She sees herself healed, but she doesn't realize that she's been healed. She's talking to Yongi Cho and her voice has been completely healed. Because God gave her a picture to work with. She was freed from throat cancer, totally delivered. Abraham believed. The moment he could see what God sees. See, here's the thing about faith. Faith comes when you see what God sees. Faith comes no other way. It's not I believe something is going to happen, but I believe because I've seen it happen. And see, a lot of believers, they, they go into their next year or they, they, they're seeking breakthrough, but they're doing it wrong because they're trying to press in without first coming before God and say, show me what you see. And when you see what God sees for your life, you're always healed, you're always set free, you always get your breakthrough. Amen. So b blind Bartimaeus, he saw himself healed. Why was he crying out? Because he knew that when Jesus came, he was going to be healed. He saw himself healed and he was healed. So today I'm, I'm saying to you, as you're going to next year, whatever it is that's before you, ask God, give me spiritual sight. Ephesians 1 says, may the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God come and may it enlighten your understanding so you would know the hope of what God has called you to do, his inheritance that he has for your life and his power that's towards you. So in other words, what it means is that we come before God and we don't have to be all weird about it. We just come before God and say, God, open my eyes to see. When you look at me, tell me what you see. What's your purpose and plan for my life? As you gave Abraham a new picture, would you give me pictures of my life? And you spend time with him until he begins to write on your imagination, on your heart, the plans and the purposes he has. And that's when faith comes because you've seen what he sees. If I was to ask for one thing this year, for one present to unwrap, it's spiritual sight. Open my eyes to see. Not scrounging around trying to get by. Not trying to make ends meet. Not, not arguing with my family and, and, and frustrated. But God, lift me up and cause me to see what you see. It's worth going away. It's worth walking. It's worth taking time to get before God before we walk into this next year blinded. Say, God, I refuse to go into this next year blinded. I want to see what you see. Is anyone else there with me? Holy Spirit, you said you'd give me eyes to see. You said, call unto me and I will answer you. And I will show you great and mighty things that you don't know. Well, I'm trying that once. Bartimaeus called out and he called out. 
and he called out. Because let me tell you something. It's not that God's deaf. Listen carefully. Listen. It's in the calling that our hearts are prepared to receive what God has for us. And we think God's going, well, you've been a bad boy. You've been a call 25 times. I'm going to make you pay. I'm going to make you, I'm going to make you, you know, come to me and beg. You're going to have to pay big time because I'm being very patient with you. No, it's not like that. Jesus hears us the first time we call. But as we keep calling and expressing our heart, that, that, whole, that whole thing of coming before God and calling out, it's preparing the ground for God's answer. I want you to know that God's going to give you spiritual sight. He says, call unto me and I will answer you. Not maybe, I will. And I will show you, show you sight. Things that you've never known before. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has it entered into your heart the things that God has prepared for you, for those that love Him or wait on Him. And God comes by His Spirit and He opens our eyes to see. I don't want to be going down the wrong track. I don't want to take the wrong course. I don't want to be joined to the wrong people. I don't want to have the wrong dreams and visions for my life. God, anoint my eyes to see. So I'm wondering if you would do something with me today. Take your hands. I know this might sound weird, but you know what? God, God responds to our acts of faith, and I just want you to put them on your eyes. And we say, Lord, as we lay, put our hands on our eyes, we imagine that you did that to Bartimaeus, and you caused him to see. And we ask, Lord Jesus, no matter where people are at, whether they don't know you, whether they've known you for a long time, wherever they're at, cause their eyes to see. Open the eyes of the blind. And we're believing, Lord, that this next year is going to be the greatest year that we've ever had because we're going to see more clearly than ever before. Today, as you're Listening to my voice, if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can do that. The Bible says you believe with your heart and you confess with your mouth. You say, Jesus, come into my life. Open my eyes. Cause me to see who you truly are. Cleanse me and wash me from my sin for going my own way without you. Would you come into my life and be Lord? And the Bible says if we pray that prayer and we pray it from our heart, we shall be saved and Jesus will come as the light of your world.